and welcome. There is no doubt that India has some of the finest minds, has produced some of the finest researchers in the world. Nobel Prizes have been won by people who are a product of the Indian educational system. But some people would point out that those prizes have been won by people whose education may have been rounded off with education or work experience abroad. Is there something in our education system that could perhaps be tweaked so that students can better apply the concepts that they have learned? Are we too much about rote learning, about reproduction of what is taught rather than really understanding it? Well, to discuss this, we have a fantastic panel here today. The one and only Mr. N.R. Narayan Murthy, founder of Infosys. He's also a trustee of the Infosys Science Foundation. Professor P. Balaram, an eminent Indian biochemist and former director <coughs> of the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore, one of the places leading research in the country. Jyoti Tyagarajan, an educator with a strong experience in curriculum design, 30 years experience of teaching mathematics and physics in India, in Zambia, and in Kenya. And wonderfully, this time we're also joined by two eminent educators from abroad to give us the international perspective. Mr. William Scott has been teaching high school mathematics for more than three decades. Joining us from London, Dr. Christopher Berry, who teaches mathematics at the Winchester College. Professor Balram, do you feel your achievements in research are because of your grounding here, mm. despite it? What, what are your thoughts on this? I would very strongly believe that whatever I have done is because of the education that I received in India. But I think over the years from the time I studied to the present day, the Indian educational system certainly has run into difficulties. There has been a deterioration. There has been a deterioration, particularly in the fact that we don't have uh, teachers. We also do not have a sufficient number of uh, good institutions to cater to the very large number of aspiring students because of our very large population. And there's been a general decline in academic standards in mm. schools and universities across the country. So things are not as good as they were perhaps some decades ago? I think basic education was much better 50 years ago. The quality of students passing out of our engineering colleges and universities has been steadily declining. The data is the following. In 19 95, we used to conduct a training program of just two months. Around 2000, that five years later, we had to change it to a four month long training program because we found that they were not adequately trained, adequately educated rather, well in their colleges. In 2006 or 7, I don't remember, we extended that to an eight month long training program. So the data clearly points out that the students that are passing out of our universities today or our engineering colleges are not fully equipped to discharge their obligations to their employers without a proper training within these companies. Mr. Scott, if I could bring you in here, do you feel things are improving, getting worse, status quo? One thing I do know is that the internet should be a level playing field for us. And the opportunities mm -hmm. today um, is just marvelous, and especially if we start thinking about those children who struggle with access. I think a challenge for all of us is to get the technology and internet in the hands of our poorest students and how do we do that? That's the challenge because that's the level playing field. If we can get wonderful teaching resources through the internet to the kids, I think we have great opportunity. Now, Mr. Muthi, you yourself are a product of a simple government school. Mm -hmm. But as we discussed, education perhaps had a better foundation, a better quality many years ago. What are your key recommendations? The problem has arisen because of a very positive thing that India is doing. And that is, we are scaling up enormously. Mm -hmm. Just to take the 
case of just engineering colleges. Perhaps sometime around 93, 94, we probably had about 400 engineering colleges. Today, probably we have about 1,800 to 2,000 engineering colleges. That's an enormous jump. Similarly, at school level two, there has been an explosion in the number of schools. So therefore, the solution that we should uh, attempt is to maintain quality while scaling up. The real problem starts at the other end of the school. The high stakes test at the end, mm -hmm. which is so dependent on facts, okay. learning of facts and producing those facts, is probably what is driving the education further down. Uh, one doesn't realize that one doesn't have to do this for the first six, seven years of their education. You know, we can put them into this crunch in the grade mm -hmm. nine and 10 and produce perfectly decent um, students at the end of it with high marks. You but don't need to have these third grade students going to tuition with huge amounts of homework. Thank you, Nothing exactly, like that. exactly. Kids have changed markedly in the, la in the 30 years that I have taught. And we, our teaching hasn't changed. So somehow we have to teach the teachers. How different is it in the United States? What do you think is working there in terms of getting students to apply what they are learning rather than just uh, learning it by heart and reproducing it when an exam comes? We need to focus on how students learn mm -hmm. and not on how to teach. And I think that's really the key to it. And I think most of us, if we think long and hard about how we learn, I think most of us, our most uh, meaningful learning experiences was not in a lecture hall listening to someone talk. I actually think it's just the opposite. We have the most opportunity to learn when we're in small groups and we're challenged with guided exercises that help us work with colleagues in America as well, there is a feedback given to the professor, to the teacher at the end of the year about how happy the students were with their teaching. How important is that, do you think, Mr. Scott, in terms of giving confidence to the student to actually raise questions at the larger level as well, because they have that confidence to raise those questions in class? Well, I, th I think that's exactly it. And the key is at the end of the, at the, end of the school year, or at the end of each mm -hmm. trimester, the students evaluate me as they do all my colleagues. And what I continue learning is that the, uh, from them, frankly, is that they're happiest when I ask good questions and then I get out of the way and I let them <laughs> wrestle with ideas. They have access to resources in ways that we never did. Um, they can go to Google, they can go to the internet and they can get an answer in a second. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to encourage that. We need to encourage to, to find information on their own um, I can't even begin to know uh, one one millionth of the knowledge that's out there and to imagine that I can is foolish. Uh, what I need to do is to turn my students into learners, and which means ask good questions and get out of the way. <laughs> I love that. So get the students to find the answers themselves rather than expecting it all to come from you directly. You can guide them towards finding those answers. That, that, that's fantastic. Now, uh, Dr. Berry, you gave up that career in finance, you wanted to teach, which means that you have got the joy of teaching and obviously you've tapped some joy from your students also. What makes a joyous student? What makes a student want to learn? There are a lot who are fascinated by um, the beauty and the, the, the patterns that they can see in mathematics uh, and love to explore that and that's if you get people like that then enabling that and as as i entirely agree with what mr scott was saying about uh asking good questions getting out of them out of the way getting out of the way yourself and allowing the 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 development of ideas to happen in front of you that, that, asking questions and then leaving nanoseconds before you, you accept an answer is absolutely not the right way. You need to let them explore for themselves. The internet is fantastic for helping you to acquire the mm. necessary skills in order to be able to address those questions intelligently. However, the, the interaction, the ability to interact with your peers, uh, with a potentially guiding light, mm is something that I 
struggle to see how that could happen uh, any other way than person to person. Person to person, yes, absolutely. And that's, it's also a bit of a relief for people who don't live on the internet to hear that as well, the importance of that human interaction, <laughs> <laughs> really. Western system teaches you how to learn. Uh, and I think whether you are in school or whether you're in a PhD program, I think it's very important to figure out how you learn. Yes. And I think the role of the teacher, as they pointed out, is quite clear, is to teach students how to learn. Uh, in India, very often what has happened is that teachers teach you something which is necessary for you to pass an examination. Yes. And I think slowly we need to uh, get away from this uh, philosophy and allow students to learn. The kind of project-based education, uh, having students work in groups to solve a problem mm -hmm. uh, and learn for themselves to make their own mistakes. I think this is the way even our system needs to go. So the Indian education system up here some time back, probably down again, they aim to take it back up again. Well, after a short break, we'll be getting questions from our audience here. We have students and teachers in the audience here, and they'll have questions from our panelists after a short break.